I speak to you in the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sanctifier. Amen. It was one of those uncomfortably hot summer days. The, the heat was oppressive. The humidity felt like the addition of a warm shawl placed upon one's shoulders. The sun was intense. It was like a, a magnifying glass or a, or a laser aimed in our direction. Though the buildings around offered some shade, they were not really an escape from the irrepressible temperatures. But we had a destination in mind, and so we kept walking. Conversation was kept to a minimum. The, the effort seemed too draining. This was in Rome a few summers ago as we made our way to the Basilica of St. Mary and the Martyrs, which is better known as the Pantheon. From out of this intense heat, we moved into this magnificent and significantly cooler cathedral. It was not just the change of temperature, but also the striking architecture and the design that drew us in, in many more ways than one. Some of you have been there, too. I'll try to describe it in just a few words. It was originally built in the year 120, as a Roman temple, but became a Christian church about 500 years later. Those are the historical numbers, but walking into the place is quite exquisite. It is round, for one, and it's hard to tell which direction one should be looking. It's very pleasing to the eye, as the height of the building is equivalent to the width and the dome, the dome is huge, staggeringly so. And at the center of the dome is the piece that grabbed me. For right in the middle is a large circular opening to the sky, the clouds, the, the sun, the stars. The eye, or the oculus, as it is known, provides much of the light inside the pantheon. It lets light seep into the darkness below, but also links one to the heavens above. It seems to link your eye with God's eye. If you haven't been there, after the service, look up some pictures of it, the, the Pantheon in Rome. I couldn't stop looking at the oculus. It invited a conversation, a dialogue, a a prayer. It expanded your view, your thoughts, your prayers, your purpose, your dimensions, your faith. Light in the darkness has a way of doing that. Light linking to the other has a way of doing that. Light affecting your view of God has a way of doing that. Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, and somehow came to the mountain of God, Mount Horeb, that great meeting place with God, that oculus, if you will, of encounter with the holy. Moses discovers this bush that is burning but yet not consumed by the fire. He sees the light of God, but it does not destroy him. He finds holy ground, not filled with an angry and destructive God, but one who calls him closer and nearer and intimately. God wants to see him, the whole of who he is. He takes off his shoes as a sign of knowing the light of God inviting him to transformation and transfiguration. We too are called to this same light. Listen again to what God says to Moses, for it's significant in God's relationship to Moses and to humanity. It reduces the distance between us and God. It affects how God's love and grace is known in the world. It speaks of relationship rather than regulation. It speaks of connection. 
For God said to Moses, I will be with you. This is the cornerstone of the promise God makes throughout the Bible, seen ultimately in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. I will be with you. Moses wanted to know about what this might mean and asked God what name he was to use for God, and God said, I am who I am, or I will be what I will be. In other words, God is. This speaks volumes to me. While we wrestle with definitions and facts and tight descriptors, God says, I am. God is life. God is presence. God is with. God is amongst. God is known. God is recognized. God is greater than the limits we might create. God is. God is. Matthew Fox picks up on this theme and writes, God is wholly present where we are and not up, up, and away from us. He says that the most appropriate symbol or picture of this divine omnipresence is that of a circle of water with fish in it. He says we are the fish. God is the water. We breathe God in and out all day long. We are in God and God is in us. We do not have to look up to find God. We need simply to wake up to the truth that God has been here all along. And very likely our consciousness is blocked up and lack the simplicity of waking and seeing. He describes this presence of God to be the transparency of God, where God is not only above the world and in the world, but is also through the world. Jesus spoke to his followers about his upcoming death and resurrection, and they just did not seem to understand or comprehend this depth of love and gift of I am with you. And so Jesus spoke to them about setting their minds on divine things and not human things. Jesus urged them to think deeply about their relationship with God, the burning bushes of life, of holy ground, of the oculus of God, and not forfeiting their life and trying to gain the whole world. God's presence is known all around you, Jesus was reminding them. Continue to seek out those things that bring life. The same is true for us, so that we might turn our attention to the transparency of God in this world, on, on holy ground in this world, on God's presence in this world, on the kingdom of God in this world. Be transformed. Remove the sandals from your feet and come to know that God is, God was, and God will always be. And that same God who is, is inviting you to draw closer to burning bushes that are known even now. Amen.